Welcome back to the latest episode of the Flex Success Podcast, where we teach you how to be less shit. As always, we will be your co-hosts. I'm Lizzie, and this is Dean. Now, if you find value in this episode, be sure to give us a like, subscribe, and drop a comment below on YouTube. Share us with your friends, give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast app, and if you want to take a screenshot and tag us on Instagram, just do that by putting in at flex underscore success. And while you're on Instagram, you can check out everything we offer from our eBooks to courses and programs. You can book a consultation or inquire about coaching via the link in our bio, or you can do that on our website. Enjoy the episode. Today's podcast, I feel is action packed. My head is spinning. Hmm. We've waited until the 11th hour to record this episode. Um, normally we, you know, have a week or two. Hmm. We have it ready a week or two before it's published, but there's just been so much happening. We thought we'll record it right before the published date so we can share it all with you. Mm, and I've decided to rock the beanie as the last London recorded podcast. Really? It is. It is, it is the, the next, last London recorded podcast. The next one we record will be in Portugal. It's true. Which is super cool. So I, I rocked the beanie just to, to bring that to light. Got a warm cup of Joe, as the Americans say. Why is coffee called Joe, Dean? Oh, I don't actually know that answer. I don't know either. I'm sure it's a very simple answer, but we don't know it. But anyways, let's start with, okay, for those of you that follow along uh, Dean's personal journey, he just got off the bodybuilding stage for the final time. I mean, look, never say never, but you have no intentions on competing again. I would like to say never because I don't think you should leave things open to chance if you are truly giving it up. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, one of, the, one of the problems that I've had in the past with competing is I've always felt like I've left something on the table because I've come second in every national that I've done. Except and this then, time. Yes. And then um, in doing so, I'm like, I may compete, I'm not saying no, and it was always in the back of my mind. Yeah. Whereas I'm quite comfortable in saying I won't compete again. Yeah. But you know, if like life circumstances change and I die in a, cr a train crash and you've got all this energy and nowhere to put it, you might do a prep again. I was going to say, if you leave me and I'm depressed, I'll bury myself in bodybuilding <laughs> like all good bodybuilders do. I could leave you and that could happen, so never say never, but no intentions. Right. And Dean, you won, didn't you? I did. I won the light heavyweight British title at the Ben Weeder Pro Qualifier. Little <laughs> engine. I love it. And we're going to today talk about what we're calling optimal quitting, which is an economic term I got from the Freakonomics podcast, not something I coined myself, because I ain't no genius, um, and talk to you how optimal quitting ties into Dean's decision to no longer compete and how you might be able to use optimal quitting in your life in various aspects. But yep. before we get there, Dean, we are quitting Flex Success to open up a professional sandwich making it's business. Story time. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to explain this? Ugh. Right, so we stayed in a previously described as lovely little apartment in London. Cozy. We know what cozy means now, yeah. don't we? Um, it was a tiny little kitchen with a it tiny had, little... It was a kitchenette. It wasn't a kitchen. Well, basically, you needed to use the hot plate as the bench top. Yeah, there was no bench space. And it had a little bar fridge, which is difficult for a bodybuilder who eats a lot of food. Yeah, which was tucked under the stairs. Tucked under the, and so it was, was the microwave. So I basically had the, very cozy. I had like lumbar kyph. I was I was I was like all bent out of shape in my back because I had to twist and turn to get in under the stairs to put the microwave on to make my cream of rice, my famous cream of rice. Um, and anyway, we cook a lot because I eat a lot. Well, and we, we also, also enjoy food. We can't eat. Well, we couldn't eat out when Dean was prepping. So every meal that Dean ate and then me as well, we cooked from home. Yeah. And he eats four meals a day, I eat three or four meals a day. Yeah. You know, we cook a lot. And this this little apartment was sort of sub floor, so down the stairs in yeah. a in a London terrace home. Yep. So it wasn't very well uh, aerated, let's say. No. The door was always closed because we weren't really allowed out in the little public area. Yeah. And um, apparently, if you cook food regularly and you leave with a backpack on, regularly to go to the gym or maybe take the food that you just cooked with you on an adventure. You may be running a commercial business, Liz. What kind of business though? So, you know, a commercial sandwich making business. The <laughs> Airbnb host, Dean booked it. The Airbnb host can review the guest, right? Just like the guest can review the host. And they said there was strong garlic smells, or I think they called it disgusting strong garlic smells. Thank you mm. for- All day long. All day long. Um, and also, by the way, when we rocked up, um, we, you know, we eat a lot of bread and the bread here, the bloomers in England is quite tough. 
And so as we're cutting through it with their really flimsy knife, the knife was bending. So we messaged them on the first day and said, like, is it possible to get a better bread knife? I like, said, hey, we love bread. Yeah, we, we eat a lot of bread. We, we eat a lot of bread. We have it daily. Yeah. Which we do. We have that rice sourdough on the daily. Mm. Yeah, can we get a new knife? So they commented, they, they reviewed Dean and said um, that we were running a professional sandwich or commercial sandwich making business from their kitchenette. And they couldn't believe that somebody would use their space as a commercial business and this is disgraceful and blah, blah, blah. And look, <laughs> I get that sometimes there's a few things that are consequential, sorry, that are um, a coincidence. The knife, we were cooking regularly, but how can you tie, how can you join the dots between they asked for a new knife, they cook regularly, commercial sandwich making business. Whoa, that is like a huge leap. That are not dots that somebody should join. <laughs> It wasn't even a, I think they may, they said they are most definitely, they most definitely ran a commercial sandwich making business out of it. Why sandwich making? Because a bread knife? Are there not other things you can make with bread? What if it was a panini business? What if it was a, a pita business? There's so many options. <laughs> what if it wasn't a business at all and we just fucking cook a lot, you yeah. idiots? Anyway, oh. we should have known better. When we got there, they had a lot of signage up about rules around cooking and um, a few dog whistles towards what you can't cook. And all sorts of stuff. Um, so that was that was a lovely experience. We, we, we decided to actually, like I said, quick flex and take this up. Yeah. So see you flex. We're running a and commercial what sandwich. Call, what are we going to call it again? Oh, Joppo came up with um, Butter Me Softly was the mm. name of our business. Um, oh, there were so many good ones. I think Butter Me Softly is my favourite though. That was pretty funny. Salted with salt. Oh, um, Airbnb BLT was another one I loved. <laughs> that was good. That was very good. And obviously our dog Reuben, so there was Reuben sandwiches. Um, but the, the funny thing is, Dean obviously tried to get this review removed from his Airbnb because uh, the next places that we try to book might deny us because they don't want a commercial sandwich making business out of their house. And Airbnb are like, no, sorry, if the host stands by this comment, we won't take it down. Mm. And Dean's been denied since then, hasn't been able to book anything. Um, and booking London has been difficult where mm. we are currently where we arrived last night yeah oh. what, what an adventure sorry next can i just one more short story before we move mm. on to optimal quitting we have booked so many places in london on my airbnb that also continue to get cancelled i have um great reviews on my airbnb so it's not about that i think maybe there's some price gouging going on i don't know but London, we feel like we were going to sleep under a bridge because we just we couldn't get accommodation approved or it would get approved and a few days later denied. Um, I finally found a place. We rocked up yesterday afternoon. On our first official day of our new uh, life. nomadic life, yeah. Yeah, first day of Dean no longer prepping where we can just relax and enjoy ourselves. We travel for hours to get there. We drag out because we have a whole life in heavy suitcases get to the front door, knock on the door. The guy answers, we're like, hey, you know, do you, are you here to give us the key? He was like, what? I, I live here. I was like, yeah, we, we rented this place for Airbnb. He's like, no, this isn't an Airbnb. And we're like, is this actually this address? And it was. Yeah, it was the right address. Turns out we got scammed. Some guy put up his, well, put up a house on Airbnb. Airbnb took our money. We rocked up there. We had nowhere to go. Absolutely yeah. nowhere to go. We couldn't book anything because we, we booked some places on Airbnb, but they kept declining it because there was no notice. Um, so we were homeless. Mm. And thankfully, my friend Dom, hi Dom, if you're listening, she doesn't listen to the podcast. So I don't know why I'm saying that. <laughs> she had a couch that we could crash on. So this is where we're recording the podcast today. She, a beautifully decorated apartment. Mm. And she has a new puppy that we got to hang out with named Wally last night. He's a cute little girl. Um, and we finally found accommodation. So that was a nightmare. And um, Airbnb are ignoring me. I said, like, this is ridiculous. Like, I got scammed. Are you guys going to refund me? Are you going to compensate us? Like, what's going on? And they're just not replying. So, fuck you guys. <laughs> well, not you guys. Not you guys. Fuck you, Airbnb. <laughs> I hate that they have such good places on there. Yeah, we've used a few other options so far. Tripping.com. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, luckily for us, so far we have a accommodation booked for Portugal. So we should theoretically go through this swimmingly. Yes, we should. You know, but yeah. What else is the news? Well, I was told them already that I, I, I won, which is cool. What so else? that was a redemption. I don't know if the last podcast we spoke about, I got second. Did we do it? I don't think so. Let's give a quick recap. Yeah, so like I did my first comp here in the UK two weeks ago, and I was in the heavyweight division. 
Um, I was fairly comfortably in there by three or four kilos in, from the lowest weight cap, mm -hmm. under the top end weight cap by about six kilos. Mm -hmm. um, ended up getting second uh, to a, a really good quality competitor uh, in Reese. That was a battle. <clears throat> um, we decided though that we would play the game of condition as I like to do, Joe and I, and we sucked down here 10 pounds. So Conditioning about, meaning being really lean yeah. for those of you not in the circle. Four and a half kilos off in the next two weeks from an already very well uh, dieted down body. And uh, we made it into the category below, so I made it into the 198 pound division, which is just under 90 kilograms. And uh, yeah, it took the win against a couple of previous British champions, which was really cool. Um, I was really happy when we got there actually, because in, in the competition beforehand, it was all British judges, and obviously everyone knows everyone except for me, because I'm the, the weird Australian. Um, but at this competition, so they that had, was a disadvantage. Yeah, they had mm -hmm. the, the head judge was an American fellow, I believe. They had an Italian judge. They had a French judge. Nice. Um, they had uh, credit to two bros. They had a really, really diverse uh, judging panel. So everyone was kind of looking at everybody with fresh eyes yep. and judging them on their merits. Um, so yeah, won that. Super relieved having come second at a nationals now for two consecutive competitions. And the ones that I did, this is the first one I've won at a national level. Let's call them national. Yeah, because you won Queensland's. And then in the overalls, um, got beaten by a, a absolute fucking monster. This guy, what was he from? He was like... From Czech Republic. Fuck, he was epic. He's pro level. He was apparently 270 pounds on stage, which is like 125 kilos. Wow. Uh, a bit taller, but <laughs> he's only 26. Man, so Dean won his category. But for those of you that aren't in the bodybuilding circle, the winner of each class get together and um, battle it out for the overall winner. So Dean won his class, but this other guy got his pro card in the overalls. Mm -hmm. And like, like who can be upset? This guy was insane. He was the undeniable winner. He was, he was yeah. awesome. He'd just come off the super heavyweights and he tried to hand his um, medal to one of the guys backstage. What do you mean? Like, as in like, cause he had to get back on for the overalls. Oh, can you please hold this? Yeah, he's like, yeah. can you hold this? And we always were like, why don't you just keep it on? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like we all know what's happening here. <laughs> That's funny. So, yeah. um, but I was going live, I logged into Dean's Instagram and I was going live on his account so that all his followers could watch. And as they were announcing the winner of Dean's class, I was that nervous that I think I was having a heart attack and forgot to breathe at the same time. And I was pointing the camera at the stage and I, with my other hand, I was covering my eyes and looking down because I just couldn't, I, it was just too nervous. I couldn't handle it. Um, but congratulations, Dean. Thank you very much. And uh, now at the peak of my performance, I'm giving it up. Giving it up. And we're calling that optimal quitting. Why are we calling it optimal quitting? Because it's quitting before it's too late. I think it's like the easiest way too to Too late quit. for what? A lot of people, I think, on the way up in whatever their chosen domain are, are always looking to progress to the next level, to the next level, to the next level. And there's always this sort of ever-reaching level that people think that they can get to and it could be you know like i made this amount of money now i want this amount of money or you know in poker i have this hand but maybe i could get one more better card and a lot of people don't have the ability to stop in that moment and think is this an optimal time for me to quit with the greatest potential to succeed at whatever it is i'm trying to achieve mm -hmm. so like in poker it would be to win like you don't need the best hand ever you need the best hand to win that round mm -hmm. you know uh, and for me it's like I could continue on, but there might be a point in which it just becomes a burden to me, a burden to other things in our lives, uh, which we, we were definitely going to discuss. Um, or maybe I start to enjoy it less because it does do all those things. So it's, I'm at a time right now where I really enjoy bodybuilding. I really enjoyed the journey of the last 85 weeks of committing to that process. I'm exceptionally uh, satisfied and content with the achievement. And instead of getting greedy and thinking I can get more, 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 I also recognize that it's starting and has become a burden on a lot of other things that provide a lot of value to me, like our ability to live this nomad life. Yeah. Um, for me to have some freedom around some social settings, all this kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. it's an optimal time for me to quit because I can leave one domain happy, satisfied and content and enter into the next one still like okay with it without having broken both of them. Mm. I like to think of optimal quitting as like the point where the benefits are no longer outweighing the costs. Mm. So for example, if you, I don't know, want to get a university degree or you want to save for a house or you want to decide if you're going to continue bodybuilding or whatever, anything you want to do are going to come with some costs. But 
in order to be happy with accepting those costs, the benefits must outweigh that. Absolutely. But for you and for us as a partnership, I believe that the costs were starting to be greater than the benefits. Um, because like you said, Dean, we are trying to live this nomadic life and being on prep has hugely limited what we can do and where we can go and the experiences that we can have and this dream that we've had. Um, yeah, it just seems like the costs are too heavy. Mm -hmm. So to give uh, an example that everyone can probably relate to because not everyone's a national level competitive bodybuilder. Um, if somebody wants to lose weight, for example, and they want to weigh 60 kilos is the goal weight and they get to 65 kilos and the things that they'll need to do to get those last five kilos off might corrode their relationships, might actually not be too great for their health. The level of hunger that they'll have to deal with is making them moody and tired and things like that. Optimal quitting for somebody at that stage would be, I'm going to accept 65 kilos instead of 60 and just maintain this because I'm not willing to uh, endure the costs of whatever, mm. the, the next five kilos. Um, so it's more about priorities and seeing the bigger picture and understanding that everything's a yin yang. There's always some bad with some good and some good with some bad. And which one are we going to choose? Mm. That's how I see optimal quitting. Yeah. I mean, I think the issue that people may have with the concept of optimal quitting is that quitting is typically seen as a negative. Yeah. Like maybe you could think of it as finishing, not mm. quitting. It is called optimal quitting. That is the economic term. Yeah. But I think it looks more like finishing and going down a more uh, prosperous route. Or maybe even stopping, optimal stopping. Stopping, yeah. Because you can stop and start. You mm -hmm. know, there is the opportunity to restart that journey should you wish to. Yeah. So I mean, maybe it's, you know, uh, time or context specific, specific to this weight loss one that you mentioned, the 65 down to 60, like you're optimally stopping at this point in time. And there, there may actually be a time further down the track that you might, getting that yeah. five kilos off now actually has a greater pro than a con. Yeah. You know, like it's no longer Christmas time. So it's easier to, yeah. Yeah. Like or that. like, yeah, you have to compete in a particular division that's weight uh, specific. So, mm. but op maybe, maybe, yeah. Optimal quitting is the, is the term it's optimal stopping or optimal finishing. But I don't want to say pausing though, because I think pausing leaves you, like I said at the beginning of this podcast, open to always thinking like I'm kind of one foot in, one foot out. Yeah, that's true. Mm. Yeah. So I think you do need to have a definitive stop point. Mm. so that you can move into the next phase, which is the yeah. phase that you're essentially saying had two greater cons that was now. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's how I thought about um, me finishing up jiu-jitsu. I did Brazilian jiu-jitsu for a very specific reason. And once I felt like I had achieved what I started it for, I decided to, to stop um, mm. because there were quite a few cons for me continuing. Like, Financially, it's a bit expensive, but that wasn't really the reason I was, you know, injured all the time. It was very time costly. It was interfering with the gym. And if I loved jujitsu and I was doing it for at like a, as an end in itself, not a means to an end, I would have continued, but I was doing it as a means to an end. And I reached that end and I thought, why am I still doing this? I like, I, I got out of it what I was doing it for. Maybe this is the best time to finish. Mm. So it wasn't that I quit. It was that I got what I wanted. You got what you wanted. I was going to say this is the exact same yeah. scenario. Like I was never chasing a pro card ever in my life. It's or you were never going to do this forever and ever. It wasn't no. going to be like a lifestyle till you were 80. I don't want to be a master's competitor, no. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that, but it's just not for you. Yeah. 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 I think you'd be a great master's competitor though. Uh, by the time that I become a master's, I would hate to think what my translucent skin will look like. What do you mean? So the thing I love about a master's bodybuilding competitor is they've kind of lost all the suppleness and the collagen out of their skin and it becomes papery, thin and grainy and nasty. And I kind of already have that. Mm -hmm. um, so by the time I'm a master's, it's going to be like, ugh. Which would make for a good competitor. But, um, okay. yeah. If you say so. <laughs> love it. It'd be, it'd be an interesting experience. But, and, and you know what? That actually is probably a, an interesting comment in that. Your own comment is interesting? Yeah, no, in that the master's <laughs> consideration is that rejoining bodybuilding as a master's competitor. Which after, is over 40, it's still very yeah, young. But after a, a long period off where you're doing, like most people do the life thing between their 25 and like 45, right? So re-entering it as a master's competitor may actually be an optimal time to restart if the environment suited itself, mm -hmm. you know? Um, like, like if your kids are grown up. Yeah, like yeah. you've gone through all of those things that bodybuilding was going to interfere with. Yeah, um, because life's over at 40, is that what you're saying? May as well just bury yourself in a prep. 
Absolutely. That is what a young person would say. And I'm sorry to all the masters listening because that's not true, Dean. How dare you, you should be ashamed of yourself. There was absolutely no innuendo to that whatsoever. <laughs> that's what he was saying, guys. Yeah. Send hate mail. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, I think I, it's a really, a really cool concept. I think um, it's actually very relieving for an individual, or especially for me, to have the opportunity to choose when to quit. I don't think Finish. Finish, yeah. Uh, or choose when to stop. I don't think people give themselves the opportunity to do it because everyone's always worried about the negative association with saying, oh, I stopped or I quit. Yeah. I have no problem with saying that I'm, I'm, I'm giving up bodybuilding because I haven't had the conversation with yourself and even with myself internally around like, what does that actually mean for me now that I'm not going to compete? What do I There's get? so much excitement to the, the what I get back, you know? Um, we just need to get into our place so I can relax and feel like we have a home again. Yeah, yeah. So um, if anyone's new to the Flex podcast and don't know like where we're at, uh, Dean and I left Australia the, like, the 29th of December 2021 and we've been in England this whole time. So it's nearly just on three months in England, right? Yeah, just over three months in England. And the plan is to choose a new country every three months, continuing to coach uh, through Flex Success just from our laptops. And what we want to do is experience new cultures, put ourselves in uncomfortable situations. It's going to force, you know, growth and open-mindedness and adventure. Um, and because bodybuilding prep is so rigid, you know, you have to train on these days at this time, do these things. You have to have a gym with this equipment. You have to eat this type of food, this amount of that food at this time. We can't just like go out to a market and see where the day takes us and try new things. Um, we're really uh, ball and chained. We were really ball and chained to the prep. So we weren't able to do that. And now we're still gonna, well, I'm still gonna train four days a week. I don't know, what are you gonna do? I would do four, yeah, probably four. Yeah, I've, yeah, four days is fine for me. I'm still gonna eat meat and veg for most meals, but there's just a bit of wiggle room now. I don't have to eat at 10 a.m. It could be 11. I, you know, it, you are crazy. I, I can choose something from a market that sort of fits my needs more or less. And if it's a little heavier on cows, I'll just go lighter or like on dinner. It's, oh no, now you can give it to me. That's true. Like, you know, like yeah. uh, typically when we've eaten out before, it's something's a little bit more calorific, so to speak. I'll waste some food. You'll, yeah, you'll I won't eat, eat it all. Whatever a portion of it, and then leave the remainder that you've you've enjoyed. Yeah. Whereas that it might be now like we can choose that and we can go half and half. Yeah. Which suits me too because I don't want to eat just all of the calorie dense food. I want to do exactly the same as you. It's just my portion control is larger. Yeah. Mm. Because you're heavier, you have a higher calorie tolerance. So we're really gaining a lot back by finishing. So if anybody's thinking about something that you might want to optimally quit on, it might not necessarily be that you're pushed out of doing something. It could be that you're pulled mm. into doing something else because you weren't pushed out of continuing to prep. You were pulled into a nomadic life. You did say you'd leave me. I do. No, <laughs> well, that's not true. I'm just... I didn't say you'd leave me, but I did say that I wouldn't be in a relationship with someone that wanted to comp prep forever and ever until the day they died. And neither would I. That's not a, a life I want to live. Nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I shouldn't say that because obviously some people enjoy it. Some people do it and it's for them. Yeah. But that is the thing though. They, they they're not pulled have... into another life maybe. Yeah. Or yeah. maybe they're pulled into doing it together. You know, maybe that is a part of their connection, which is really cool. And that's the, the beauty of individuality in regards to how you want to live your life and the things you want to do. But it, what you mentioned there is exactly that. I wasn't pushed out of bodybuilding. I was pulled into the nomadic life and what that offers. Yeah, and Me if you weren't and, being pulled into us. this, you probably would have continued, wouldn't you? Yeah, because it probably would have been giving me that 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 level of drive and satisfaction that I seek in life to progress something. You know, whereas uh, I see the nomadic life as an opportunity for me to progress myself as an individual because I'm not someone who typically does throw myself into adventures. Mm. I am somebody who really does like a routine, uh, and then you know, the nomadic life is not that. <laughs> um, if, if we were still in contest prep yesterday, had that have happened with the travel time, like we were talking about three and a half hours worth of travel time with the expectation of being inside. But so I took one meal, but then we couldn't get into our accommodation because it was a scam. Then we to cook, so then I would have had to have found food somewhere. Yeah. You know, and I would have been, been grumpy and annoying. You and would have had to have found time to train. To train, yeah. yeah. So like, 
It came at an optimal time. It came at a good time, did, um, for sure. But yeah, being pulled into something I think is a really uh, cool uh, point of awareness. Yeah. In regards to determining which direction you go with your choices. Mm. Which might be a thinking point for you, listener. Mm. If you're thinking maybe the the costs are outweighing the benefits for this thing that I'm doing, it doesn't have to be fitness related. It could be you're studying and you realize this isn't for you. It's a sunk cost. You know, you might not use that degree anyways. What's the point of continuing? I think you should explain the sunk cost. Okay, I'll explain it in a sec. Um, what are you being pulled to? If you stop this, what opportunities will it open up? And if the answer is like, I don't know yet, then maybe figure that out. Um, okay, so a sunk cost is um, when, like, let's say I have paid a lot of money for a meal. The meal comes to the table. I'm like, whoa, I didn't realize how much oil is going to be on this. It's going to send me over for calories on the day. It's not even that tasty. Instead of eating it anyways, because I've already put resources, you know, waiting for the meal, the money. Instead of eating it anyways, because I've already put resources into it, it's a sunk cost. I'm not going to get that back. I'm not going to get the money back. I'm not going to get the time back that I waited for the meal. So continuing to go through it, to eat the meal, to overeat on calories, eat something that I don't really like is silly because those resources are sunk already. Mm -hmm. So that's a sunk cost. Yeah. Has that explained okay? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. It's something that you've already paid for, essentially, so yeah, one something. way or another. Mm. Uh, and, yeah, and continuing to use it, do it, whatever. Isn't going to give you more benefit. <laughs> no. And potentially may actually give you further costs. Yeah, In exactly. this instance, if you're using further it three years Like after. somebody who's been in a shitty relationship for 10 years, but they're like, oh, but I've already been in it for 10 years. Like, it's a sunk cost. You're not going to get that time back. You're not going to get the energy back that you put into that person. Move on. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's the simplest thing, but... I don't think a lot of people really ask themselves why they're doing something. Yeah. Like how many people are like, I want to lose five kilos. You know, they lose the five kilos. And they're like, you know what? I might now lose two more. And they don't go, what, what, why? Like, oh, because I think I should, you know? Yeah, so and it's then, hard for them to figure out where the, when to quit, like where the end goal is because they never actually figured out what the finish line was. Yeah, like my why was I wanted to win a national title. So my original why was I wanted to win a Queensland overall. Well, that's title. not a why. That's a goal. Yeah, that was my goal. You know, and the why is because like I have a an extreme level of competitive spirit. You wanted to be the best. And I wanted to. I wanted my efforts to be recognised with a win. <laughs> you know, um, that wouldn't have been the only reason why I would have quit though. Like I would. I decided that this was the last season, regardless. Yeah. It's just that because the cons again outweighed the benefits to me. You know, it's just that that was a nice little cherry on top. Mm. But I had asked myself a lot of time, like, why am I competing? You know, and my, my, my competition why has always been for the self progression of uh, the application of the skill set that I learned over the years as both a coach and as an individual. It's like, let's put this to the test. You know, what can I achieve? Can I can I achieve a level of leanness that is not typically expected of individuals? And can I do this even this year? Was very important for me to do it while still upholding my my coaching abilities. And thus far, I think I've done that, which has been cool. Uh, but now even that is a, a, a con to me, I've realised. What's that? In that, although I've upheld my requirements and you know, due diligence as a coach to my clients, there's been a large amount of mental fatigue associated with my own prep, which then only goes further into then the coaching. Whereas the moment it's I It's harder that, for you to coach other people when you're also mentally fatigued. Yeah, the you. moment I finish that, it's now it's like I'm 100% excited solely for the client. Yeah. You know, whereas I was let's say 99.9, .9, but then also worried about myself. Mm. Um, whereas now it's just like, whatever. So you think that quitting at this point is gonna make you a better coach in the future? Absolutely, you yeah. know, um, absolutely. I think, it's, I think it's nice that I can show that I can walk the walk. Um, not that I think that's necessary to be a good coach, uh, but now it's that all of my energy and all of my efforts can go solely into them. Is and it walk the walk or walk the talk? Huh? I think it's walk the talk. What did I say? You said walk the walk. I, I like after you said that I didn't listen to anything you said because in my head I'm like I'm pretty sure it's walk the talk. But anyways, I'm sorry I derailed you. Um, do you think that competing yourself has made you a better coach? As an individual who is not that empathetic of others, it's made me at least appreciate the pains associated with prep. Mm -hmm. In saying that, though, I said this on another podcast. I think that's also a dangerous recognition in that because I don't 
think that I find PrEP as difficult as some other individuals, my assumption could then be is that they're not really cut out for it and that this isn't that hard mm. because I've done it. But and you also is, don't have children like some other people yeah. prepping or you don't have eating disorders like some other people But prepping. the other thing yeah. is that I am me, you know, and me is the only person that I truly understand in regards to how difficult I find a prep. Yeah. Uh, but it has at least given me the opportunity as an earlier stage coach, like back in the beginning of my career as a coach, to um, be able to give people some foresight into what they may expect. Mm -hmm. Uh, whereas I think as you grow as a coach and time progresses, you get all of those experiences from the clients when you ask the right questions. So I can I can lean on what my co my clients have experienced to then warn my future clients of what they may experience. Yeah. But I think in the early phases, my personal uh, competitive uh, sort of bodybuilding at least allowed me to do that quicker. Mm. Um, but I don't think you have to be a, a competitor to be a coach. Or... Mm. But you just think in your experience, it's made you a better one. Yeah, I think I think it. Because of your personality. I think it speeds up your understanding of the process faster uh, and the pains. Yeah. Um, but it could also be detrimental. Like if you're no good at it and people are like... But we're talking about you and you were good at it. Yeah, I know. But if you are no good at it, you're potentially like... Discrediting yourself. Discrediting yourself because you're saying like, I'm a bodybuilder and um, I mean, what is a bodybuilder? This? No, but yeah. A narcissistic tan <laughs> person. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> um, check my notes. Oh, I... I painted Dean's nails. Shout out to Mike Pearson, mate. I can see why you enjoyed this. Uh, Those just listening are like, what are they doing? This is not I, a visual platform. Yeah, but I, for YouTubers... I currently have pink nails <laughs> uh, with stripes, stripes on them. Uh, one of them looks like cat's eyes, I reckon. It does. And uh, I don't know why I've enjoyed having my fingers painted. But I have. Yeah, you have. Yeah, I wanted to say it. No, we're not. We're we right. won't say it, no. Um, yes, Dean, love it. I, I forget what we were saying now. I was just talking about experiences as a coach and whether or not it's uh, improved. Sorry, experiences as a competitor has improved my right, ability right, right. as a coach. Oh, no, you were saying that if you haven't done well, it could discredit you. Yeah, purely because people are going to be like, do you not have the ability to recognise that you're not cut out for this? Yeah, okay. You know, like the, they may question your sanity. Yeah, yeah. And, and I wonder as well, like, for you being a successful competitor, um not only gives you mm, like some standing with your client, but maybe your clients know, well, you know, he did it, he knows what works and it, it um, encourages more like buy-in or the client has more confidence in you as a coach because they know that you're, you know, at champion level competitive mm. bodybuilder. Yeah, I mean, I don't really typically uh, associate myself with the word of inspiring, but there's a lot of clients of mine that have, have used that terminology towards my prep, That's especially nice. because of the fact that I've done it well, for the last three months in a foreign country, you know. Yeah. Still living a nomadic life. Like we've moved on average every three weeks here. Yeah. So we've found a new gym, you know, we've found new supermarkets, we've cooked different food, used different utensils, like all that kind of stuff that would typically throw a bodybuilder. Oh, man. Because yeah. bodybuilders are, like, the bodybuilders that I know of are very much, like, just routine, don't change, can't go out of their comfort zone. Yeah. Um, a lot of people have found it inspiring to use their words for their own preps to say, hey, like, I'm sitting at home, I have my comfort in my house, comfort in my kitchen, comfort in my gym. I know the supermarket. I know the supermarkets, yeah. I know how much this costs, I've got my friends to support me. Mm. Everybody knows what's up, you know? And I just need to now find my groove. Yeah, if Dean can do it, then. Yeah, which yeah. is cool. Yeah. Well, it's been nice watching you um, go through the process without complaining, like knowing what the important things are and just focusing on that instead of like trying to do absolutely everything, including the things that make half a percent difference. Mm. You know, I think that um, you're a very focused and dedicated person and like never did I hear you complain, even though it was really hard. Uh, I actually, I wrote a post about this recently. There's nothing wrong with reaching out saying that you need help. Um, there's nothing wrong about expressing your feelings, but sometimes just accepting the fact that something is going to hurt and zipping it and like getting on with the job can go a really long way. And that's something Dean does really well. He typically zips it and just gets on with the job and gets it done. Um, because venting or expressing yourself to someone is helpful sometimes, but maybe at other times it just holds you back and it's not actually beneficial. It's just mm. venting for the sake of venting. Let's not dwell on the pains. Let's just get it done. Or even reframe the pains. 
Like, give me an example. Uh, or even reframe like how you feel. So like I, I noticed in the prep, whenever there were extreme bouts of fatigue, if I lent in on the recognition that fatigue existed, it just made the fatigue worse. Yeah. Whereas when I reframed it as like, you know, um, this is just an indication that what I'm currently doing is achieving this positive goal of fat loss. Yeah. Like, don't walk slowly. Let's pick the pace up. Every time I shifted my mindset into, hey, let's try and walk faster, my energy came up, you know. My fatigue went down. Mm. My perception of the pain became positive. Um, not that I think that's necessarily something you should always do, but just a lot of people, I think, let themselves get buried in a prayer. Like they dwell on it. Yeah, they yeah. dwell and they seek the pain as a reason to feel bad. Or be moody or... As opposed to recognising the pain, the hunger, the fatigue as a just a, an expected result of what you're currently doing. Expected symptom. Symptom, yeah. Mm. Like bodybuilding is ridiculous. You are expected to train at your maximum capacity while being fed at your minimum capacity and starving yourself for months on end. Mm. There is no competitive sport, not that I'm saying bodybuilding is a competitive sport, but there's no competitive sport that asks their athletes to do that. No. They're always fed functionally to the amount of effort they need to put in. Mm. And we're saying, let's do the opposite. Yeah, let's underfeed you and overtrain. So there's just no reason why anyone should think that they should feel good. Um, they should always expect to feel some level of fatigue, and if not bad. And being an extremely process-focused individual as a bodybuilder, I think is incredibly important. Uh, having it, having heard that uh, originally, is that James Clear? Yeah, it was from Atomic Habits by James Clear. But it was systems-focused, right? Well, I mean, I, I came up with the concept um, before I read the book, and I called it process focus. Yeah. Um, versus outcome focus, but he calls his systems focus. Yeah. It's the same thing, just a different word. I like process and yeah. like my clients would be sick of me saying that black and blue to them, like, you know, be a process focused daily task individual. The more that you can do that and sort of divorce yourself of that emotion, uh, I think bodybuilding prepped actually become very simple. Yeah. You just have to learn to control the fatigue. Yeah. The meaning of that is like not looking at the outcome and determining your success or failure based on, did I lose weight this week? but determining success or failure based on the process. Did I eat the food I was meant to eat? Did I do the training sessions I was meant to do? Did I sleep the hours I was meant to sleep? Mm. And a success, because we don't, we can't control our body or control our weight. We can only influence our body and influence our weight. And we do that by focusing on the process. Yeah. The, the most important tick boxes. Yeah. yeah. And if, if you rely upon emotion to determine your level of success in a week, and you're not so process focused. Like looking in the mirror and being like, do I feel fat or Yeah, or like, yeah. I don't feel like I've done enough this week, or yeah. I don't feel like I trained hard enough, or I don't feel like I dieted hard enough. Um, you'll, every week, especially towards the end of a contest prep, you'll, or even- Doubt and phase, chop and change. You'll doubt and change, and then you potentially give yourself the opportunity to say, well, have the uh, fuck it menta uh, mentality. Yeah. Well, I'm not, I'm not winning at this, so I may as well just enjoy myself. I actually wrote about this in the final chapter of the Untangling Fat Loss ebook. So if anybody's read that, you'll be familiar with this concept. And I, I put together a little graph of, so I was doing a cut for a photo shoot that I did like maybe a year ago now. Hmm, time's gone so fast. And um, I probably got down to about what, 12, 14% body mm -hmm. fat by the end. And so, like, I guess body fat within my little mini cut, I only cut for six weeks because I started at like a leanish physique anyways, would have been somewhat linear, you know, week by week I was going down. So I put that in a graph, but then looking, and then I, I also put in a graph how I felt. So one day I felt 22%, or maybe it was like a period week or something like that. You know, the next day or the next week, I was like, damn girl, you look 10%. And so if I chopped and changed my diet, like, oh, I'm having a fat day, I'm gonna eat less, I'm gonna train more. And then I had, you know, a really lean day, oh, I can get away with more food. I wouldn't have gotten very far because how you feel isn't always actually what's happening. You know, maybe someone made a, a comment to you, good or bad, and that affected you. You were bloated that day, that affected you. You didn't have much sleep, whatever it is. It's the process that we're focusing on and how you feel does not matter all that much, which is the beauty of, um, I mean, it matters all that much to like the result, I suppose, but it doesn't all, it doesn't matter all that much to your progress. I think I'm trying to say. Yeah, no, yeah. 100%. I've, I have these conversations every week. I mean, some of the times that I think I probably thought I looked the worst were at the end when I looked the best. Hmm. Because I felt the worst. Well, you're also hyper focused on your physique because you're trying to make an improvement. So you're always looking, critiquing, pinching, whatever. Yeah, I'm not and looking for the positive of my physique. I'm looking for what can I fix. Yeah. 
So you're always saying, what is wrong? What can I fix? And did I do enough to do this? Mm. But if, if you can check in with yourself at the end of each day, and like for a bodybuilder, this is very simple. Did you do your output, e.g., did you do cardio, did you do steps? Yes, tick. Did you eat the food within you know, a, a given percentage of the macronutrient targets? Yes, tick. You know, did you train and maintain and or progress training? Yes, tick. Yeah, did you sleep enough? But even then, you know, those three things, mm. they're, the, they're the brunt of a prep. Food, training. Food, training, output. Output. So input, output, and... Um, so Dean's splitting gym training and like general movement and or cardio yeah. into two separate categories here. And yeah. if you can tick those off every day and provided that those things are set up in an appropriate manner to achieve the result, you get the result. Yep. You just need to not worry about it. Yep. Easier said than done. Yeah, but of course this is if you have a reasonable plan for nutrition and training. If your plan for nutrition and training is unreasonable and you're not sticking to it, you know, some or all of the time, it might not be your problem, it might be the plan's problem and you need to adjust that. Mm. Um, so definitely keep that in mind for sure. Yeah. But anyways, maybe we'll wrap it up, eh? With an actual wrap? Yeah, please. Um, Harry Mack, finish it with a wrap. I ain't got a rap. Sorry. No? You didn't prepare a rap for this episode. I'm unbelievably not creative enough to do it <laughs> on the spot. It's definitely not. Uh, okay, well, we usually wrap up our podcast with a something worth sharing. Ooh. Do you oh, have something? I want a British start. <laughs> oh, we already shared that. Yeah. <laughs> do you have something mm, to share? What are you reading right now? I. What's the name of my book? I've just gone blank on it. Humankind? Yeah, Humankind, yeah. yeah it's That's good. a cool book. Um, an interesting book, actually, in that he is arguing for the sake, not arguing for the sake, he's arguing that people are inherently good uh, and that we see the bad in people, but he blames the environment in which we live in, the social settings, for bad behaviour over the actual individual being inherently bad. Mm -hmm. um, and he refers to a lot of like sort of tribal situations and situations when we would have expected individuals to have maybe fought and gone to war, but they haven't. Um, collective co I read a little bit of the start of the book and he was talking about collective cooperation and mm -hmm. um, people perceive like you know if, it, if there's a natural disaster or a war or something like that um, people will take advantage of each other or, whatever, or if you're stranded on an island it's going to be the people are just going to kill each other I'm just going to murder you so I can eat and you can't yeah. um, and, and not recognizing that most people actually band together to try and help each other and I'll tell you what wouldn't that be a fucking nice place to live well like, he's saying it we is. can yeah, yeah, but the perception is because of all the, like, you know, media telling us that all the people that hate us and all the people that want to bomb us and all the people that want to do this. and mm. like It makes us suspicious of the other. It makes us suspicious and then people get their guard up. And, mm. But if the reality is, it's like you pat me on the back and I pat you on the back, we all move forward. Yeah. Yeah, he was saying that it's a self-fulfilling prophecy if we're, uh, we expect the worst of others because mm. then we might not treat them as well. Yeah. Good book. I like it. It's good. Makes me want to watch Lord of the Flies, was it? Yeah, he was Talk talking. about Lord of the Flies. Yeah. 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 Humankind. Good book. Do you remember the author's name? I do not, unfortunately. Okay. Well, I'll put it in the show notes. Mm -hmm. Well, Ruth, who edits this podcast, will put it in the show notes. <laughs> yeah. Now, finals yes. was all how to be less shit. Oh, yeah. How to be less shit tip. Mm. I suppose the how to be less shit tip, the take home point here is whatever you're doing, decide what the end point is. And when you get there, it might be time to consider optimally quitting. Mm. Or even if you haven't gotten to the end point yet, but you've realized that the costs are outweighing the benefits, maybe decide what else you could be pulled into. What are the opportunities for you if you stop doing that thing? Mm. Um, not that you necessarily should, but it's worth considering. It's worth thinking about instead of continuing to grind at something that might not be actually serving you. Yeah, and I think it would probably be a smart idea to sit down at the beginning of whatever the said goal is. And when you look at the pros and cons of what they achieve for you, maybe consider having like a, uh, uh, like a, a red flag con. Okay. You know, like if X happens, that's going to be, I want to I want to make sure that I'm optimally quitting before that. Yeah. Like yeah. I, I want to compete in a bodybuilding prep, but if it gets to the point that my children feel neglected yeah, or something, yeah, that, whatever it is, mm. then I'll stop. Um, all right. Thank you, Dean, for sharing and for being such an awesome athlete. Thank you for calling me an athlete. Sorry, I didn't really mean it. I was an athlete, but I didn't you're, you're in a sport. You're a beauty pageant competitor. Mm -hmm. I'm a, a, an athlete that is in a 
competition that's non athletic. Would you rather? Yes. Have come second in this competition and have optimally quit bodybuilding, never have won a national title. Mm -hmm. Or have actually won, except um, while you're on stage, you got a nervous erection and a nut dropped out the side and everyone now knows you as that guy. Well, first of all, it wouldn't be a nut, it'd be a pee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, I would, I mean, as much as I would love to win, I would rather optimally quit because I recognise what that means for my life. No, no, that's fine. But I'm, I'm saying either way you've, you've quit. Like that yeah. was the last competition. Mm. My question is, would you rather have um, not come first? You would have come yeah. second or... Second with no nut out. With no nut or um, and nervous erection or have come first, but you got an erection on stage and your ball dropped out on the side and everyone remembers you as that guy. And then quit as well. Yeah, and quit. Yeah, Did way. I really optimally quit though? <laughs> my nut came out on stage. And you're known as that guy. Go on, what's your choice? Um, did I deserve second? No. Oh, then I would rather have come second. Okay. Because if you knew you deserved first. Because bodybuilding is so subjective, it's the one thing that I've done where I've been okay with not winning because I recognize that not winning is not necessarily a representation of what I've achieved in the prep, mm. but rather a representation of what people perceive to be better on the day. Yeah, just the judge's decision. Yeah. Okay, there you so, go. Yeah. And that's a wrap. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, it's been great talking to you guys. And the next time uh, you'll hear from us, we will be in Portugal. I believe we will be, we would have done two weeks in Lisbon, which is the capital of Portugal, and we would have just arrived in Lagos, which is in the Argive, Argive, is that what I'm saying? Argive, yeah. Of um, Portugal. And we'll be there for just over two months, Portugal. I believe. Portugal. Mm. Mm, and we'll have some some custard tarts in our belly. I feel like next time we should definitely be eating a pastiche on here. Let's do it. We're going to we're gonna have some food on the next podcast. Maybe you want to watch this one on YouTube. And we should do a guess the sound of this on the podcast. <laughs> well, I'll just bite into crunchy things and everyone can eat. We get a really good microphone and eat our mouths open. Fuck, that would be the most annoying podcast. We're not going to do that. That would be super <laughs> annoying. All right, love you guys. Thanks for the support, everyone. Bye.